have you ever peered through a genome glass? Possibly not. Now, when I was a child, I remembered everybody that I met. I remembered their birthdays. I remembered their phenotypic characteristics, which means their physical characteristics. I remembered stories about them. And that's why it was, it was fun. Sadly, I don't remember anymore because I meet so many people that it's difficult for me to be able to understand them based on the three dimensions of physical appearance, location, and time. I need a fourth dimension. I need a, I need a genome glass to be able to uniquely identify them and to be able to remember specific stories about them. Now, this uh, genome glass of mine is going to be like a combination of a Google Glass and an Alice in Genome Land. The Google Glass, obviously, it won't be as, as ugly, but it'll probably be embedded into our eyes. And this is where I feel that we will be able to combine the science of the genomes with the art of storytelling to make our interactions with other human beings much more exciting. Now, to be able to understand what we are doing and where we are going, I'm going to talk about how, in this midst of this big changes that are happening across the world, where we are talking about large-scale population predisposition, where a worldwide effort is being made to be able to understand how specific populations are understanding the role of genetics in not just our traits and how we look like, but also in, in our disease predisposition. But more importantly, also there are efforts and ancestry in being able to understand inherited conditions and many other things. In this whole effort, once we start to understand a lot of the efforts going on in that space, we are able to then make it much more precise going from there. Now, in order to explain that, I've written a small little poem. Now, this is also inspired by Louis Carroll. And it goes as, Will offspring with pure genetics grow as blue-eyed medicines wonder? Research is discreet, and I am vowed to it I shall surrender. That advances in genomics shall hail the love gift of a fairy tale, or will it? Some have not seen the sunny side, nor heard of it in daily chatter. The thought of genomes shall find a place in their lives hereafter. Unless a tale that started in the age-old days when life was simple and flowing, a simple habit that can be served in time through the rhythm of our knowing, whose implications may lie in our genes through generations over time. Now, the last two lines essentially are an implication that there is a role of genetics, there is a role of epigenetics, which means our lifestyle and our habits are actually passed down in generations over time to our next generations as well. So it is important not just for yourself, but for your future generations that we adopt a much more healthier lifestyle. Now, my inspiration to be able to create something of impact in the genetic space came from multiple learnings along my, my life. The first such learning that I remember was from a trip to a temple. When we were a family visiting a temple, we went to this temple in North India, which said that any wish that you asked for would be answered. When the Pandit asked my father, what he would wish for. He said he wished for, the, for peace for the world. The Pandit insisted and asked him, can you ask for something for yourself? To which he said, I am part of the whole, but the whole is not part of me. And the whole influences me in more ways than one can imagine. He further added that if the whole world is peaceful, then I am peaceful too. But it is not necessarily the other way around, because if it is not peaceful, if you are in a war-inflicted area, it's, for instance, it would inflict you too. And so it basically reminded me that doing good for the larger good is good for us as well. So if we are able to do something good for a much larger population, it also implies that it, we are doing good for ourselves. And as a result, we said, how do we provide personalized preventive health care to 100 million individuals and to be able to create a knowledge repository of 10 million Indian samples so that we are able to then use that information to not just create better solutions for ourselves, but you are able to then do it for a much larger community. Now, here's a small trailer of a film that many of you might have the physical seen. physical and mental characteristics it's a of movie every Gattaca, unborn child. And it was created in 1997. So this is way before the human genome was actually completed. But what it says is that in the not-so-distant future, a small drop of saliva or blood is going to determine who you are, what you can be, who you're going to marry, and so on. 
So you can see that this was done way 1997, and today a lot of what has happened is already in reality where we are in terms of understanding a lot of genetics and a, a lot of things from that little uh, drop of uh, saliva. So inspiration, I think, can come in many forms. And one of the reasons for us, for instance, to be able to create Map My Genome came from this book, Against the God. Now, this book is about financial risk management and many other things. But there is this painting on, this, uh, on the cover, which is a painting by Rembrandt, which is called The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. Now, when I was reading this, it was quite interesting that when you look at how uh, sailors went to sea, it was not that people did not go to sea earlier, but once the compass was invented, it was much easier to be able to then say, how do you manage risk in the world of uh, you know, going into the ocean? You were able to go much further, make sure that you come back alive. Similarly, I thought, if you could create a health compass that allowed you to be able to not just understand what risk is there ahead of you, you would be able to understand whether you have the capability of going in that particular direction or not. It's similar to how you would take an umbrella on a rainy day, or you would be able to take multiple different precautions in your daily life. Similarly, you would be able to create a health compass, and you're able to navigate your lives much better. Now, if you think about how medicine has evolved from the 1900s to the 2000s and so on, you found that it moved away from a find it, fix it model, where you had a problem, you fixed it, towards now a personalize it, predict it, and prevent it model, which essentially means that earlier you didn't have enough data. You didn't know enough to be able to say, how do I personalize this for myself? But today we have a lot of information about ourselves where you can personalize it and predict it in terms of not just diseases, you're getting a lot of data in terms of your own health data, but you are able to actually prevent disease. And this has only happened because you now have the participation of consumers in their own quest uh, for understanding disease and other things. Now, if you fast forward to 2050, I don't think uh, genomics is going to be the coolest thing, but you're going to have something that's going to replace what we currently use as an ID card, and that would be a different kind of a gnome, a different kind of way you would currently look at how we would say, oh, you would have on that ID card interesting things like your genome, pro proteome, metabolome, microbiome, and so on. Now, in this uh, way, when you move over here, you would find that things are not being done the way they are currently done. And that would be a brave new world where your data is being generated by multiple different devices, you're tracking multiple different things, and you are in control of a lot of different things than you were in the past. Now, just around the time when we were about to begin our, our company, there was this big news item where Angelina Jolie had done a double mastectomy. I think it was perfect time for us to get PR, but it was also the time where a lot of consumers started thinking about what does this actually mean for me? What does it mean that I have to cut off every organ that I have when I'm subject to uh, a genetic test? Or does it actually mean that you can prolong and prevent disease from coming, right? And then there was, you know, a few news months later, you also found the stories about designer babies. But when you think about it, with any technology, while there are lots of negative things that one can associate it with, there are so many more positive things that you can associate it. Ultimately, I think as a human race, with, you know, we have the power to be able to use technology in the way we like. And as they say, with great power comes great responsibility. And for us, it is important to be able to use great technology like genomics to be able to use it for a better, uh, for creating a better world. And the reason I'm saying that we can use this for a much, much better world is that if you look today, Statistics are really scary. 80% of deaths in Asia are from lifestyle diseases. India's lifestyle diseases are going to grow up by 80% by 2020. And there are 87 million diabetics projected in India by 2020. And similarly, I think there are many more such statistics which make us think that we should probably think about how do you change the way we currently practice medicine. So traditional medicine, I think, currently is, and so is personalized medicine, the new health fairy. The personalized medicine story, we see that there are the four building blocks, right? You have the A, C, T, and G. And the first block is called 
the aging population where you're saying that, you know, we today live, live much longer than our, our ancestors lived, which is great. But it also means that we are not necessarily living a much more healthier life. We are, might be living a, a longer life. So can we actually prevent that from happening? And most of the diseases that we see are mostly the A, B, C, D kind of diseases, which are like the Alzheimer's, breast cancer, cardiovascular, and diabetes. The good news is that most of these are preventable. 80% of your cardiovascular diseases are preventable. And the bad news is that we are not doing that soon enough. The second thing, which is the bigger part of, the, of this block, is the consumer block. If you're saying you have now wearables, we'll probably go to insidables, embeddables, or whatever belts you want to call it. But ultimately, I think what is most important is that we, are, we have the ability now to be able to transmit data, to be able to collect that data and own that data. And I think that is the most exciting part of what is going to happen and what is going to influence the future of this technology. And then I'd look at genes. You know, we are studying a lot of gene genes currently, but as we get more data, as we get more precise, the correlations get much better. We become much more precise, and we start to understand specific populations, and we get back to where you can look at individualized uh, medicine for each person. But I think the most important thing is the tests, which are getting cheaper and much more accurate. And finally, I think if you just take a little look at what has happened over the last 14 years, the most interesting thing is that we have moved far ahead in terms of both technology, number of samples, throughputs, and so on. The graph down, which many of you might have seen earlier, is that the cost of the genome has moved from $100 million to about $1,000. And the data that you generated went from a few kilobytes to 10 to the power of 14. So there's a massive increase in the amount of data that is currently being created. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own experience with Genome Patri, which is a take on Janam Patri, where you're saying, you know, everybody should have a Janam Patri, but maybe now they should all have a Genome Patri. And the reason for me to do that was to be able to say, what do I get as consumer, or what do I get when I, when I do something like this? So when you give a sample and you, be able, you are looking at your own genetic report, you find a few interesting things. It says things that, Based on an average population, I had risk for about four or five conditions that were higher than the average. Now, one of the things which was obvious was that I had a higher risk for diabetes, which was, which was fairly familiar because uh, my entire father's side of the family had diabetes. But it was also interesting that I had, uh, you know, my sister did not have the same things, which meant that I needed to be able to change how I lived my life. Uh, better from there. So I made sure that I changed the way I actually look at my whole life rather than being able to say, do I need to create a specific diet or not, right? So when you think about it, you know, you, you're probably thinking, saying, you know, this genome glass you, uh, that you're talking about probably sounds really crazy. But you have to remember that tablets, flying cars, self-driven cars, and genomics were but, but a figment of our own imagination just a couple of decades ago. So as we enter a brave new world, and you have these questions saying, can I change my own genetic future? Will marriages be made in the lab? Will there be designer babies? Or will there be a genome glass? I think the future is whispering something very important to us. That is, that if we can imagine it, then we can create it. Thank you very much.